the problem, detecting human irrationality, bias, and egocentricity. And this time, the title is The Solution, Living, Responding, Thinking, Rationally. If you remember, last time I suggested that for the purposes of this course, it's illuminating to think of human nature as dividing into two One, a primary nature, which is activated at birth, and a secondary nature, which is merely potential and may never be activated. The primary nature I linked to a certain set of tendencies by which we form beliefs, attitudes, habits, irrationally. And I, ex I, I explained irrationality mainly uh, through examples. I talked about how, for example, there's a tendency for people to believe what people around them believe. This, of course, is based on the assumption that the people around us are good guides as to the truth, or, if you like, the assumption that the people we associate with have the truth. That's the assumption it's based upon. Very few people articulate that assumption or think about that assumption. The natural tendency is simply to find yourself believing what the people around you believe. Uh, this is a common human tendency. Another tendency that I mentioned, ir as irrational as the first, is to assume that what we believe is true because we believe it. That, let me, let me put this a somewhat different way, this is based on the assumption that we, or I, or my group, have a special pipeline to the truth. And that therefore, whatever it is, we've got it. We couldn't be wrong. You might ask yourself, as an American, did you ever consider whether capitalism was wrong? We call it free enterprise. Many people in the world believe that rather than free enterprise or capitalism being a good thing, that it is a bad thing. Well, it may be good and it may be bad, but have you as an American ever seriously considered that it might be bad rather than good? Or have you rather, like most Americans, just taken it as an article of faith? Of course it's good. It's our system. It's our system. Therefore, it must be good. Therefore, it must be right. Because we believe in it. This tendency is the tendency of all peoples everywhere at all times. You can't find a group that doesn't believe that way. Every group that has come down the pike has believed that their system was the best system. So to believe that your system is the best implies, from one point of view, how non-unique we are because we share in this common human tendency of believing that we're special. If there was a group that ever emerged that believed that it wasn't special, it would be the first special group because there has never been such a group to my knowledge. So this tendency then spells out in many forms. If what we believe is the truth, then what others believe that is different from us is false. And if they act on beliefs that are in opposition to us, then they are our enemy. And because we are plugged into the truth, they must be plugged into error. And add another premise, which I didn't discuss last time, 
It is also part of this primary nature and is irresistible from the point of view of our primary nature. We not only have the truth, we are good. We are good people. We are morally upright. We stand for what is good. We have the correct values. To put it crassly, we are the good guys. It follows, therefore, that those who disagree with us and who hold opposing points of view are the bad guys. If there is a God, then he must be on our side. If there is a devil, he must be behind the others. All of these tendencies are absolutely reflexive, natural, spontaneous, and irresistible to our primary nature. You don't have to try to think that way. In fact, it's hard not to think that way. And you come to think in another way only if you're one of those rare people who cultivate rational capacities. For example, your capacity to recognize this and to act to, in a countervailing fashion. Now, underneath both the, what I'm calling the primary nature and the secondary nature, is a common feature of what it is to be human that contrasts nicely with a feature common to most animal species, if not all of them, as far as I know. And that is the contrast between beings or creatures that live by inference on the basis of ideas and creatures who live on the basis of instincts. So if you were to study as a biologist, zoologist, bees, bears, salmon, frogs, birds of various kinds, you would find that the behavior of one bee, salmon, bird, whatever, within the species is a pretty good predictor of the behavior of every one of the species. Because, let's say, to take nest building, uh, nest building in, in most birds is innate. They don't have to learn how to build a nest. They all build it in the same way, using the same kinds of things, and it ends up looking like every other nest that every other bird of that species builds. You don't have ranch-style nests and <laughs> tri-level nests and different conceptions of what a nest should look like and so forth. Nests are not built on ideas of nests. They are built on in the instinct or they reflect the instinct to build a nest in a certain way. And as far as we can tell, the bird doesn't have to think about it, just act. But with humans, a common characteristic, whether rationally used or irrationally used, whether egocentric or not, we live in ideas. And by inference, as a result. In other words, everything that we come to know or experience is a process that results from two things, two general categories. One, the nature of the world and two, the nature of our ideas about the world. So that our experience reflects both of those. To put it another way, we never experience reality in some pure, unadulterated, unconceptualized, metaphysical way. We experience some conception of reality. We experience some image of it, some picture of it, projection. some projection or interpretation, some way of looking at it. We see things from an angle, from a vantage point, with a purpose in mind, with values in the background. These are all ideational things. And that as a result of the interplay or the application of these ideas to experiences, raw experiences, we come out with a full-blooded human experience. 
And we don't experience these two parts separately. So we don't experience first, here's the raw data. Now upon that data I impose my concepts and out of the imposition now I pull uh, my experience. It's very difficult to try to separate those two. The result is, because of that difficulty, plus our egocentric nature, our irrational tendencies, we come to believe that we don't really experience some perception of things. We think we just experience the things themselves. The result is that if people disagree with our perception of things, we get angry, we, it bothers us. Because we don't think that we simply experienced an angle on things. We don't think we saw them from one point of view. We think we saw them as they are, period. Now, I am, I am not meaning to imply that every experience is equal in its dependability, accuracy, and objectivity for reasons of the fact that we can experience in a highly egocentric fashion and we can experience in a more rational fashion. But the more rational kind of experience emerges out of a critique of the problems inherent in experiencing things in the usual way. It doesn't come naturally to us and it doesn't result in a perfect product. It doesn't result in the final and absolute truth. It results in partial truth at best, which may be all we need, and in any case is all that we can get. Let me give you a very mundane example. You come into this room, and you sit down, and you're here for a certain period of time, and you leave. Suppose the question is raised, what happened? What's there? What was going on? Well, there are lots of ways to conceptualize what's going on here. There are things going on here in this room that are perhaps not of major interest to most of us, so we don't experience it at all. Uh, consider, for example, just the way all of you wear your hair. Now, however you wear your hair, uh, if somebody asked me to describe how somebody was wearing their hair, I probably couldn't describe it because my, most of my attention is focused on the ideas that I'm talking about. And as a result, I'm not focusing in on hairstyles. But if somebody in here was a hairstylist, that person might be noticing the styles of various people because that concept, that noticing, is so basic to them that they do it without having to think about it. So they're built into their frame of reference. And so that person might be able to go on and on and on about different people and split ends and uh, bad haircuts and good haircuts and whatever, this kind of haircut, that kind of haircut, this style, that style. Whereas the rest of us, because we either lack the concepts that articulate that frame of reference or lack the interest to apply them, can be in this experience and not get any of that data out of this experience. Now that's just one thing, that's hair. In addition, there's clothes, there's eyes. In this room, there are many things to be experienced, and you and I will only experience a very small segment of what is here to be experienced. And this is of necessity, because we can't plug our brain into multiple channels of experience at once. We can't say, brain, aspect A will experience hairstyles, B will pay attention to body language, C will focus in on that, D will listen to the lecture, E will reflect on things I have to do later. <laughs> it would be interesting if we could do it. But apparently, as far as we can tell, the human mind can only focus on basically one thing at once. And the greater the degree of attention given there, the less attention can be given elsewhere. This is another way of pointing out that we must experience from some conceptual vantage point. We can change that vantage point, but we can't escape and achieve some supra vantage point that includes all vantage points or most vantage points or whatnot. We think within a point of view, it's a point of view which can be narrow, it can be enriched, it can be subtle, it can be naive, 
It can be ethnocentric, it can be broadened, but it can't cease to be a point of view. It cannot be all-encompassing, it cannot be absolute reality, it cannot be everything that is there. It is some screening out of what is there by means of some ideas based on some assumptions through some process of thinking out of which experience comes as a virtual conclusion. Now, just as a computer can be fed in, you could press a button, and because the computer contains all of these programs, it immediately shoots back an answer, even though all kinds of electronical, electronic signals have flashed up and back in a moment. And you suddenly get the conclusion, but if you went to the programmer and said, well, a million steps took place between your pressing that button and that card shooting out the other side, it may have taken only a second, but a whole heck of a lot went on in that second. So too in the human mind. Hundreds of things go on in order to produce that one experience that we have. And to us, it seems like it's just there in the external world, whereas we produced it through all of these activities of the mind, bringing to bear all of our past experience or that part of our past experience which seemed to us to be relevant to this situation. And we did it in a moment's notice without thinking and came out with some experience or another. So, this is to argue that in addition to the fact that we have a primary and secondary nature, whether we're using our primary nature or our secondary nature to process experience, we're processing experience through ideas, through beliefs, based on assumption, and uh, as a result, one can say that human life is inferential. Everything that we know, experience, see, hear, is in part a product of inferences, or acts of the mind, and are never simply a recording of objective reality. If this is true, then I think we can take a step from that to recognizing what our fundamental need is. And by, by this, I mean two things. One, that we have a primary irrational nature activated from birth, a secondary nature which we can cultivate, and thirdly, that we live through inference and interpretation of the world. If all of that is true, then our fundamental need, if we want to cultivate our rational capabilities, is to expose our minds to points of view other than our own, to frames of reference and ways of thinking, alternative assumptions, alternative beliefs, because only through that expansion of the mind can its own frame of reference be expanded. That is, whatever your frame of reference is, at any point in time, it's based on certain assumptions, certain concepts, certain experiences. Now, if you keep let us say you have a certain set of beliefs. If you make sure that you hang out only with those people who share those beliefs, and you read only those books that reinforce those beliefs, and you avoid spending time or exposing you to intelligent people who think otherwise, and that when you hear about them, you immediately think them wrong and dismiss them, then your mind has no place no way, no material, no food for growth. The human mind needs opposition. It needs, to put another way, we need dissent. If we didn't have dissent, we should create it. Because without dissent, without opposition, the tendency of the mind is to narrow, close down, and solidify. This tendency is so strong that it is not difficult to find very young people who are already almost totally inflexible in their thinking processes. In this precise sense, that when you question their beliefs, they experience minor trauma. They feel threatened by disagreement. They find it painful and difficult to listen to people who think other than them. And they feel either put down by that experience or the need to put down the other person as a result of that experience. It is natural for our primary nature, our egocentric tendencies, to identify with beliefs 
And this is, a, this is a narrowing experience because the more life and time we invest in a belief as part of who we are, the harder it is to question that belief without questioning who we are, without feeling that we've got to give up something very valuable, time spent. Life is time. We live a certain period of time. If we spend 20 years committed to a certain belief, it's a lot harder to throw that belief off than if we've only spent a certain amount of time committed to that belief, especially if we've been committed to that belief egocentrically. That is, by ego identifying with it. I am important because I believe this. My life is significant because I believe that. It's through my belief that this is true, that I am important and significant. And I've been living this significant belief for 10, 15 years. Now, if you want to take that belief away from me, you're taking those 15 years away. And you're saying that's insignificant. You're saying I wasted my time. You're saying my life wasn't meaningful. That's threatening. So that the length of time that the, to, uh, to which the mind is egocentrically attached to a belief and is drawing its meaning and significance from that belief and in the believing of that belief, the harder it is then to give up that belief uh, without trauma. And you find some very young people who already show very strong tendencies of this sort so that their attachment to a particular belief is so intensive uh, that they systematically avoid people who question it and begin to project it into their life as the meaning for them, as part of their identity. To be rational, you have to be able to give up beliefs. Beliefs cannot be the beginning and end of who you are. They have to be something that you use as a guide to the extent that they make sense, to the extent that they're defensible, but not as things that make you to be what you are, ultimately and in the last analysis. You have got to, if you're going to be rational, have some distance between the belief and who you are. Now, if your commitment is to the process by which you come to the belief rather than to the belief, then no belief is set in stone. It's the process that is important. Now, a rational person is committed to coming to beliefs in a rational fashion, through evidence, through reason, and not through everyone else around me believes it, I feel better when I believe it, I feel more important when I believe it, I, make, I advance in my field when I believe it, I make more money when I believe it, I'm threatened, I feel afraid when I disbelieve it, all, not for those reasons, but for rather the reasons, this makes the most sense based on the evidence that I have, and I'm interested in more evidence if I can get it. And if the evidence begins to weigh in the other direction, then the belief gives way, because the commitment is to the process and not to the belief itself. This suggests another distinction between our primary nature and our secondary nature. Our primary nature cannot draw such a distinction. Egocentrically, we, well, let me, there is a kind of parallel there, I think. Egocentrically, we will believe whatever makes us comfortable, and if it makes us comfortable to abandon a belief that we previously held, then we'll abandon it. Let us say, sometimes, people are socially conditioned so that they become dependent for their meaning on the meaning of somebody else. Women have often been conditioned in such a way as to derive their meaning from the meaning of the man that they're with. In this case, then, if a woman so conditioned would feel a strong egocentric tendency to believe what the man she's presently with believes. If he's into politics, she's into politics. If he's into art, she's into art. And if he is opposed to something that her previous lover was in favor, she is now opposed to it. That is, when a person becomes egocentrically dependent for their meaning on somebody else, then of course the only meaning that matters is the meaning of the other. And one becomes, you know, it, it, you could see a parallel in people who become attached 
to an ideology where the spokespersons for the ideology change what is the accepted position from year to year, and the followers dutifully adopt the new position as it comes down the pike. People who, for example, follow the twists and turns of Stalin's mind as he worked out Russian foreign policy would see that he would switch, you know, Hitler was awful and terrible, and then suddenly he made an agreement with Hitler. Uh, and the party line changed, and all the followers were supposed to change their minds then about how to perceive Hitler, because the leader had changed his mind. Now, the, the egocentric mind is capable of that kind of flexibility. But you can see it's not true flexibility, it's a lack of any intellectual foundation. And it is based on an egocentric attachment not to the beliefs, but to the generator of the beliefs. Another person, an ideological spokesperson, a leader. It's still as egocentric. So there is a kind of qualification. It isn't simply that if you're egocentric, you're committed to the beliefs, but not the process. There is that other qualification that has to be added to, to be accurate. All right, what is it? What does it mean to stretch the mind and to enable it to grow in a rational fashion? Well, certainly it has to be connected with the ability to recognize that we might be wrong in a belief that we hold. It's connected with the ability to recognize these tendencies in us, the egocentric tendencies, and to realize there's a point to listening to the opposition. That is, and by the opposition, I mean anyone who thinks differently. I don't mean to say on each position there's one point of view and then it's opposite. There may be 12 points of view on a subject that I haven't listened to yet that are different from my point of view on that subject. If I'm egocentric, I enter into the discussion with a view to showing the others why they're wrong and why my point of view is correct. Now, a rational person is certainly going to tell others what reasons he has for holding the position that he has because he's interested in hearing what they have to say about those reasons. He's interested in hearing their reasons. He's interested in putting the reasons into some contest with each other in order to decide which reasons are better reasons. Now, we cannot evaluate reasons by putting them into some neat and tidy scale that somebody has provided for us. We cannot simply say, here is the method for evaluating reasons. So when you hear a point of view other than your own, use these five simple rules to determine whether your reasons are better than the reasons of the other point of view. There are various things to look for, but they are not formulas, and they cannot be applied in a kind of mindless procedure or routine. They cannot be applied without thought. They have to be applied thoughtfully. You have to use your mind to assess reasons, and the guides that we provide you with do not take the place of your own thinking. Now, your thinking has to occur in at least two ways. You have to become aware of your own thinking that underlies your present beliefs, and then you have to become aware of the thinking that underlies the beliefs of those who oppose or are different from your beliefs. Then, just as you've spent a great deal of time and energy tuning in to the evidence that supports your point of view, you need to tune in to the evidence that supports the other point of view. Now, the best place to get that evidence is from intelligent people who believe the other point of view. They spent their time gathering that evidence. It's not going to fall from the sky into your lap, but we have a source for it. The other intelligent proponents of these other points of view, they are there gathering that evidence. And that's, that's the reason why, in a trial, we give the opposition lawyers the job of finding every <coughs> scrap of evidence that they can get together, if they're doing their job correctly, to favor interpreting the case in the following way, in defense or in prosecution. And a lawyer who is a good lawyer, in developing the prosecution, will also put his mind or her mind through the process of how they would construct 
the defense because they know that the strongest prosecution is one that anticipates the defense and meets its strongest reasons. Now, if you understand this in a rational way, it means that we have to understand the strongest arguments against our position to really be persuaded of our own position. And if we come to be persuaded of our own position simply because we've never heard an intelligent opponent of it, then we really don't understand whether our position is worth believing or not. It's, it's like having heard from two people who disagree and have had an argument, one person's rendition of the argument. You hear one person's rendition of the argument, and it's almost inevitable that you're going to agree with them. I mean, I don't know why people ask us whether we agree when they've only given us one side. There is no way to disagree until we hear the other side. And notice that people would generally be insulted if you suggested that you needed to hear from the other side. Because of that assumption, I've told you the truth. Why do you need to hear from the other side? But we do need to hear from the other side, and it's hearing from the other side that we see how strong the first side is or how weak it is. I'm sure all of you have had an experience where you've heard one person's rendition of a set of events and you were persuaded that they were correct, you didn't see any way that it could possibly be construed, given what that person said, only to find that when you hear the other side, you realize that it's a lot more complicated than that. We've all had some experience of that. We all need much more experience of that, because it's true again and again and again and again. Now, you can sort of test it out by finding anyone who dislikes anybody else and getting a description of the character of that person from that person, and then go to somebody who likes that person and get their description. And you'll find you've got two different people here <laughs> described. People totally irreconcilable to each other. People who couldn't actually exist because the one is incompatible with the other. And so what you know is that you've gotten two biased renditions, neither of which do justice to the complicated nature of the individual and the way in which we reflect a strange combination of positive and negative characteristics, which you only get when you get a fuller representation of, of a person. Unless, of course, you happen to come across a person who thinks critically about the people they criticize and or defend, so that they say, this is why I defend this person. On the other hand, he or she does have these other negative characteristics, which I recognize, and vice versa. But generally, you won't find that to be the case. Generally, if people, people make a decision, you're either they either like you or they don't. If they like you, they tell positive things about you. If they don't like you, they tell negative things about you. So you can always test the credibility by saying, after somebody gives you a number of negative statements about a person, tell me some of the positive things about this person. And if they can't think of anything, then that's pretty good evidence that they have had their mind pretty much closed in a certain direction. Or if they, uh, you know, you, you can reverse it and, and do the opposite test. All right, so... If you, if you think about it, you can see a kind of analogy between the process by which we develop our bodies and the process that I'm describing of developing your mind. We develop our bodies only through pain, frustration, and discomfort. Uh, there is no way, for example, if you're out of shape, to get in shape without paying a certain price. Uh, you have to put your body into, you have to get your body to do things that it just doesn't want to do, that it isn't comfortable doing, that it responds against. And you've got to sort of force it to do that, and you've got to force it to do it again and again and again and again <coughs> until over a period of time the body changes, the stomach shrinks, the muscles tone up. But getting that process started is harder than keeping it going and, and, and getting it going loses its benefit unless you keep it going. So you can extend this analogy to the mind. You're not going to become a rational person by once in a while, on rare occasions, listening to people who disagree with you somewhat sympathetically. No more than you're going to develop a well-toned body by once in a while, on rare occasions, doing a little bit of exercise. It just won't work. The body is a product of the fundamental things that happen to it day in, day out. The mind is a product 
of the fundamental things that happen to it day in, day out. If day in and day out you listen over and over again to people you agree to, who agree with you, and you agree with them, and they agree with you, and you agree with them, and so it goes day after day, then your mind will constrict and narrow down to its least common denominator. It will become harder and harder on those rare occasions when somebody expresses opposition to tolerate it, just as it is hard uh, to tolerate exercise that first time. You know, the further you're out of condition, the worse it feels the first time. So what we're talking about when we're talking about developing your rational capacities, your secondary nature, is getting a process going which negates a process that is perfectly natural. And there's, there are all kinds of analogies here. I mean, it, uh, think of some foods, I think, maybe I'm wrong here, just naturally taste good to us. Infants like sweet things. And if you give them a choice of a sweet thing and a not sweet thing, they choose the sweet thing. It's built into the body in some way. Even though it's not good for the body, still the body likes it. I don't know why that's true physiologically. It certainly seems to be true of me. Uh, but the things that I like to eat are the things that I probably ought not to eat. And, and, and I know I can get into the habit of eating things that are good with pain and suffering. But let those things pass in front of me once again, and the old urges come back. They don't go away. But they don't disappear forever. All that whipped cream, custard, chocolate, <laughs> still looks good, even when you're in top condition. And I think the same is true of the ego. Namely, those egocentric beliefs still look good. They're still attractive, even when you develop your rational mind. Your ego doesn't go away. The irrational tendencies are not effaced. There is no perfectly rational person alive. There will probably never be a perfectly rational person. The mind is not capable, as far as I can tell, of eliminating irrational tendency, only modifying it, only keeping it restrained, only minimizing it. If the pressure comes on, if the threat is big enough, if the vested interest is large enough, the soft, deceptive tendencies of our primary nature become more and more irresistible. We have our different breaking points, but I suspect that everyone has some breaking point, and that the most rational person can be turned into an irrational raving maniac if you can put that person under the conditions which sort of break through this, you know, whatever developed shell of rationality they have developed, if the pressure gets great enough. Just as I think you can do something parallel on the physical level you can find people's breaking points. If this is true, then it implies that we are in one sense stuck with our irrational nature, and it is not therefore reasonable to expect to achieve some kind of final breakthrough which ends the battle. I don't think our irrational tendencies disappear. We'll always feel attracted initially, at least, to those who flatter us, unless they're very blatant and unsubtle about it. Right. But if they're sneaky, as all people develop some skill in flattering us subtly, our first response will be to like them. We may, if we find out they're doing it for an ulterior motive, come to resent it. But that will be because some other process took place. The natural process will be to be drawn to them, just as if somebody walks up to you and says, you know, there's one basic belief that you have that I think is totally ridiculous. Now, the first tendency is going to be to tighten up a little bit upon hearing that, and only if we're very rational can we say, okay, let's hear it, and, and then sort of open our mind to that possibility. But our first response will come from our primary nature, I think. That immediate response is going to be to tighten up or to dislike this person or to feel the need to draw away from them, to get away from them, or whatever particular technique we favor to defend our, uh, to defend our ego. So, uh, to conclude, the answer which we're proposing is in cultivating this potential capacity which we have, and we can cultivate it in many directions, but it, uh, we're not presenting, I don't want to imply to you, uh, some easily achieved perfection or, or something that can be done once and for all by taking a critical thinking course or by going through anyone's five easy steps. 
what we'll be doing in the rest of this course is exploring dimensions of this problem and the proposed solution that we're giving to it. And that's why there will be so much emphasis put upon reasoning in op opposing points of view. And one of the things that you'll find that is very difficult is to find, even though you'll have an, a, uh, a belief on the issue, for example, you'll be for or against abortion, still you'll find it hard to present the arguments on either side. Why? Because if you're like most of us, you didn't come to your belief through any reasoning and evidence. You came to it through your primary nature. The people around you believed it. It was in your interest to believe it. You get reinforcement when you believe it. You're threatened by not believing. These would be reasons that would explain more of our beliefs than that we had read both sides, reflected on the arguments, and so forth. So it will be natural for you to find, and we expect that you'll find that initially the process is quite frustrating, because when you rattle the head, the reasons don't just suddenly flow out. And we have to sort of prime the pump again and again to get that potential nature going.